first of all, um, Rabbi Singer, thank you so much for um, for joining us today uh, for this discussion, this interview. Um, I, I'd like actually like to hear uh, from you a little bit. Um, I, I know for for many many years now, many of us have have watched you, have seen you. Uh, be it in your books, in your other writings, in your interviews, in your videos, um, the the path of 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 helping Jews who have gotten caught up in uh, so-called Messianic Judaism, uh, bringing them back to the Jewish fold. I'd like to just ask you, just from a personal note, how did you get involved in that particular field? It's a, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's very niche. Uh, what what brought you in that direction specifically? I'll be frank with you. I don't know why more people don't get involved with it because it seems to bother everybody. I mean, in the Jewish world, because I haven't met anyone who's gone, oh yeah, Jews for Jews, that's great. We need more of that. So <laughs> this, is not, this is not like complicated. It's not like you know supporting Trump or Harris. This is like like across the board um, and denominational lines. People are so deeply offended that fundamentalist evangelical Christians, it's important for the viewers to know that liberal Christians are not interested in converting Jews, and most Roman Catholics aren't either, unless your name is Candace Owens. That's different. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> there are exceptions exception to the rule, right? Yeah, yeah, actually, I just saw her tell a rabbi to convert to Christianity. It was like, that was, she's a little unusual. Anyways, um, so when I, look, I was born 15 years after the Holocaust, right? I grew up around people who had numbers on their arms, and I knew where they got them. They didn't, you know, they they weren't uh, put in camps in, in Buddhist countries. I just couldn't fathom that there would be Jews for Jesus. Like, what? And something had to be done to respond Um Back when I started doing this more than 40 years ago, there really wasn't any coherent response to these very aggressive efforts to evangelize Jews. So I think it would be a very good idea to answer their questions. However, when I, th I thought I would just show them why these supposed prophecies, these putative proofs that Jesus is the Messiah, once they were shown, that these claims are completely fatuous, I thought they go, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. Now that I know that, I'll, I will believe differently. That's what I thought would happen. I said, well, here, you know, this Isaiah 7, 4, doesn't say virgin as Matthew would have us believe and so on. But that's not what happened. What happened was that people were very, um, People were very addicted to Jesus, in love with Jesus, and I didn't understand that at all. And that took a lot of time. So I, and as I learned more about what it is and why it is that Christians believe what they believe, or people involved in chosen people ministries and so on, then it just became my, really my, my life work and bring them back to the Jewish faith. And it's been very exciting. We all certainly commend you for it, and others that are that are directly involved in that sort of work. What are, what would you say is like the main motivation? What what is it uh, aside from ignorance? If there's if there is anything outside of ignorance of your own Jewish uh, heritage and and knowledge of Torah, are, are there are there certain trends that you've noticed over the years that? that bring a person into that belief and and vice versa the opposite are there certain specific uh areas that you think are are particularly helpful in bringing people back to the fold yeah so as it turns out i'm going to say something that you 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 know very well and that is jewish people who really know their scriptures who know their faith they're I can't say it's impossible for any of them to get involved in this, but it's very, very unlikely. You know, uh, basically, Jews for Jesus and groups like that, the success of missionaries represents the unpaid bills of the Jewish people. So as assimilation grows in the United States, as an example, so does the success of missionary activity. If you understand your own faith, you know how to plug into it, you're not going to be as susceptible to these groups. I mean, that just 
very simple. Now, this is very intriguing because the claim of Jews for Jesus, I know you've been exposed to this in your work and your efforts and education. Their claim is that if you just look at your own Bible, Jesus is there. I mean, the truth of Christianity can be demonstrated from the Hebrew Bible. Now, what's very annoying to these missionaries is that the people who are most likely to join the ranks of these groups are people who know nothing about the faith they've been asked to abandon. So it doesn't work. So that's the first point is that Jewish education is empowering. What's it effective is, for you that you've noticed in bringing them back? You have to figure out why they're in. I mean, what is the real story? And what you're told is not the real story. What's happened is there's a reason why uh, Christianity is the most successful religion in the world in terms of sheer numbers. One out of three people on this planet is a Christian. There's got to be some explanation for it. There's a reason why this is a very successful religion. Granted that Christian missionaries have traveled the world with a sword in one hand and a cross in the other, but that doesn't explain it all. Christianity delivers on the low self-esteem issue. People make their worst choices, worst decisions when their self-esteem is not where it should be, and people feel bad, dirty, sinful. So Christianity simply affirms that and says, you are dirty, you are sinful, there's nothing you can do to save yourself. Yeah, and that resonates for people who are struggling with their constant companion is low self-esteem and looking in the mirror, you see your worst critic. And so, so Christianity addresses that worst character trait. And then it delivers the drug on the other hand. Our other un... Um, a rather not such a great feature is gaiva, arrogance. So Christianity actually says, not only will Jesus save you, but now God speaks through you. You've become a prophet. You're a navi. You could speak in tongues. So it delivers like both drugs at the same time. Tanakh is, is exactly opposite. You're creating the image of God. Uh, it's Judaism is... God's successful effort in creating man in his image. Christianity is just the precise opposite. It's, it's man's uh, promiscuous effort in creating God in his image. And so Judaism says you can do it. God, you're creating the image of God. You can return to him, and God will forgive you even though you don't think you're forgivable. So if you can identify what's happening there, what's going on, and supply the information that the person's asking for, very likely the person will leave the church. So you're, you're saying being that they come in, in from basically from an emotional standpoint, the lack of knowledge and, and are drawn to it emotionally, the best way of bringing them out is also on the emotional level. You haven't noticed a particular uh, scripture or idea uh, theologically that is uh, particularly either effective or that they're like, oh, I, I never understood it that way. Let me explore more. It's, it's, it's more, you're saying, getting to the emotional core of the person than any sort of scriptural theological discussion. Right. So that's exactly what you never want to do. And this is counterintuitive. I, I tried this a long time ago, it try, you know, explain to Christians why what they believe is without merit. And I found it to be very difficult. It just doesn't work. And then I learned that you have to ask people, why do you believe in this? You know, when I do shows, I'm usually being interviewed as I am now. So what I'd rather do is ask the person, what is the most compelling reason why you find Christian? Now, just as a warning to the viewers, um, you call them Messianic Jews. They would never no Jew in the church would ever say I converted to Christianity. They just won't do that. You know, just like anything. That means that's the third rail. So this is just full disclosure. No Jew who becomes a Christian actually says I converted to Christianity. They just don't talk that way. They used to talk that way a hundred years ago, but that's the church realized that Jews view converting to Christianity as you're no longer ethnically or culturally Jewish. And Jews have a very strong sense of, 
I, <laughs> I nearly said that Jews have a very strong sense of their Jewish identity, which probably comes a lot of surprise, big surprise to rabbis. But Jews are, they have, so they realize that you can't do that. So no one, just like no one says I'm an anti-Semite, that doesn't mean anti-Semitism came to an end. It just no one will ever say that. They might say, I hate Jews, but they won't say I'm an anti-Semite. So, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, so, so the, 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 the using, the, and you uh, explain that, that they call themselves Messianic Jews, fulfilled Jews, anything but that. So what you want to do is listen carefully. It's the art of listening. Like, why is this so compelling to you? And just listen. And then when when the person is giving you that information, don't interrupt them. Just listen very carefully to what's important to that young man. And then you'll figure it out. But always address their issues. Never impose what you think is the reason why you shouldn't be a Christian. Always let them tell you what their criteria is, what motivates them. So we, we uh, were introduced together, I believe, about a year ago, about a year and a half ago at this point, um, by our friends over in Arizona, who the entire group of them had, had uh, moved away slowly from, uh, from Christianity and then uh, became Messianic Jews for a while, as is often the path of those that, that do this, and then slowly had crept their way towards traditional Judaism and were much more in line with that. Now, a lot of the people that um, were drawn in that direction were people that had prior watched videos of yours online and and where you actually go through many of the scriptures that are typically used by missionaries to to bring people in uh, they were they were learning and they were they were coming across your work uh, you were doing it not not to convert Christians out of Christianity you were doing it to bring Jews back to their roots but a lot of these folks had found found you online and questioned their own belief system after hearing it from a different perspective than they may have been used to. Um, I've, I've noticed, and I think, I think we even uh, touched on this or, or talked about this at a different point in time, but I'd like you to maybe reiterate for some of the, some of the viewers here. In some ways, it seems that, that Jews for Jesus and, and groups like that have actually, in some ways, sort of brought, like, not, not to their intent, but have rather than bringing more right. Jews into the fold of Christian beliefs, have actually helped facilitate um, mm -hmm. Christians coming out of their own faith and being drawn more towards Judaism. Is that, is, is that something that you see? This is so ironic, and we have this conversation, that it can be said that there's no organization more responsible for the uh, conversion to Judaism, either as a full conversion or becoming a, what's called a Noahide, which means embracing the Jewish faith but not joining the Jewish nation, which is growing exponentially. And you have a great deal to do with, with that growth. Um, then Jews for Jesus. That means it's these missionaries that are using Jewish literature in order to evangelize that sparks curiosity among Christians who otherwise, as Southern Baptists, would never be interested in anything Jewish. So what happens is these, this is so strange, you know, like our enemies come up against us to destroy us and save us from ourselves. So what's happened is that Jews for Jesus, and that's a name of one organization, but there's like a thousand organizations worldwide like that. So just, just that's the most well-known uh, group that began in the early 70s. What they do is they go, if you study your own Bible, you know, it's all Jewish. So all these evangelical Christians begin to study about Jews and Judaism, and then they happen upon you or me, and they go, wait, that makes a lot of sense, and they begin studying. So there's a reason why almost all the Nochites in the world are former evangelical Christians. There's a reason why conversion programs in Israel are packed. You, you can't even get into them. Conversion programs in the United States, very hard to get into them. Why? Because they're loaded with people who were exposed to Jews for Jesus or the Messianic movement, which triggered within them a curiosity about the faith they're supposed to 
evangelize and it just boomeranged on them. And this is one of the strangest things. And that's why there, I, I imagine your experience is the same as mine. These are not former Buddhists who are becoming Noahides. They're not uh, former Hindus who are converting Jews. There are some, it's just not many. They're almost all of them former conservative evangelical uh, uh, Christians, Hebrew roots groups. These are the people that are triggering ma massive, for those of you who don't know it, you know because you're exposed to this constantly, you're involved in this. We're talking about in the numbers so large and thousands of, I mean, I, I didn't even know them, no one knows the numbers, but it's enormous. And I would add just one thing. This is not a good time to want to be affiliated with Jews. I mean, <laughs> this is like a dumb time. We're like radioactive, right? So, you know, like think about 85 years before the Holocaust, right? There was almost none of this going on, right? Now we're 85 years after the Holocaust. We're, we have observed in the last year, almost, ex almost exactly a year, the worst act of terror uh, since the Shoah, which has sparked triggered, ironically, enormous amount of anti-Semitism. And, and it's now that everyone's like banging and said, I want a part of it, I want in. So it is counterintuitive. It's, it's so interesting that it works like that. And, and, and the truth is like that group in Arizona, one of the things that they shared with me, um, I, I, think you, I think you were there first and a few weeks I later was. I had come out. Uh, and, and they said that that kind of worked based on the spiritual journey that a lot of those folks uh, were on in that they were questioning their own faith. They came across your videos and you sort of uh, gave them the, the wording and the ideology to sort of deconstruct the, right. the workings of, of what they formally believed and right. were, were looking for answers in. And then a lot of people from there kind of discovered, well, I can't just, if, if it's not logistically sound to convert to Judaism or that's not where I'm where I'm at or what I'm looking for or what I have an infrastructure for, I need to have some development of my religious beliefs and, and, and have like a religious construct. I find that a lot of folks that, that leave Christianity, they either become atheists or mm -hmm. they, their religion becomes like a resentment of Christianity. And it, and it comes mm -hmm. with their, their religion is being an anti-Christian which right. is, is not a good place to be. Your, your theology, your belief, your connection with God is not an anti-anything, shouldn't be an anti-anything. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that, that we're involved with is helping people to develop a, a, healthy, uh, a healthy relationship with their faith and where they're at and, and coach them and counsel them in their own unique situations because there's certainly a lot of trauma sometimes and in... Um, in, in their in their in their families can be disrupted their husbands and wives that can be not on the same page and so it, we we try to do our best in in uh, directing people to live a Torah lifestyle wherever they're at in their in their journey I, I wonder what your thoughts are as to why do you think uh, in our society today even I mean prior to October 7th as well there's just in the last let's say the last generation you find throngs of people, that are from not Jewish backgrounds that that are that are driven for for reasons they can't always explain. Why do you think that? What do you think is leading them to to Torah to want to be uh, learning in a more detailed way from not only Torah but like a very traditional and orthodox uh, sort of mindset? What what do you think is leading non-Jews across the world and across this country in particular to to that direction? I see it spiritually. The, the, the major thrust of the Messianic age, which I believe we're approaching, I can't be sure of anything, but it's, it seems very clear to me that we are in the midst of a redemptive process right now. We're right there. It, it, it's like, like imagine the Exodus. So we're in like the seventh or eighth plague. Like we're very... Some of the things gonna, coming, but we, we don't know how it's going to play out, but it's coming, right? Well, you know, what's interesting about that comment is that our sages thousand years ago did that, and you said, we don't know exactly how it's going to happen, but now we we can actually look back and extrapolate from everything that's happened in the last hundred years, that everything it says in Tanakh really is happening very literally. 
And all the things we just, our great grandparents could not even imagine are, is unfolding right now. So we can extrapolate from the events that we've observed in our lifetime and go, well, if that's been fulfilled literally, and really the, the statements made in our sacred scriptures are not this, you know, you know that people have to just, you know, some amorphic idea, but well, we can then project and go that this whole thing is going to happen literally. And the key feature of the messianic age, believe it or not, is the the tshuva, the repentance of non-Jews, the ingathering of the world, that the whole world recognizes that there's one God and 10 Gentiles of different languages will grab the shirt of a Jew. This is how Zechariah 8 ends and says, take us with you, because we have heard that God is with you. So the end of days is marked by the nations going, now we get it, and Jewish suffering has brought us to love the Jews more, which is crazy. And now we understand Isaiah 53 even in what profound way. By his stripes we were healed. The non-Jews are saying that Jewish suffering elicits within non-Jews an a, an, um, a love for Jews and Judaism. So the world is very polarized now. Now, everyone will say, I don't have an opinion. I mean, unless you're nuts and have like a, you know, a pillowcase on your head. So they're, but outside of the weirdos, people have very strong views about Jews. They either love us or hate us. You know, it's very, and that's very unusual. Like, you, you think about like Chinese. That's the most successful race on the planet. About one out of three people on our planet is Chinese. People don't have very strong views about them, right? Like, what do you think of them? I, pretty good, but no one's going, I love Chinese food, maybe, but no one has a, but the Jews who, what are we, one quarter, one percent? People. So I view this spiritually. That means because we are now, it's a, it's a Rubik's Goldberg process. I mean, it's actually happening now. So therefore, the prophecy is number one of the non-Jews coming to this is unfolding now, and Number two is that God has a promise, and that is Jews who are lost among the nations. I'm going to gather you back. Read Isaiah 43 to my sons. I will bring you back, my daughters, from the ends of the earth, the furthest most islands. So there's a promise of an ingathering. So that's what we're observing today, this spectacle. that just There's nothing like this has happened since— um, maybe since the first century, certainly in the days of Ezra it happened. There's a striking thing about Jewish suffering in that it, it's counterintuitive, but it triggers an interest in Judaism. When the Jews endure suffering, people are drawn to us more. So um, I see it as prophecy fulfilled. And, and the question that someone like you and I have to ask ourselves, I think we've answered it, is am I going to be either in the stands watching this as a spectator or are we going to get onto the field and actually engage in this and be a part of this redemptive process? And you and I have both made this decision. That is, we want in. So we're very excited about that. You view this as um, as messianic. I, I think a lot of people kind of Kind of feel like that these days, and see that you know all of the all of the players that are involved in big world events right now are are kind of coming together, and all of these sort of biblical uh, dynamics are showing themselves in their modern manifestations, and it's it's a it's a fascinating, a little intriguing, also kind of daunting uh, uh, feeling all mixed together uh, that I think a lot of people are are feeling right now. Feel like. We're on the cusp of Mashiach. Uh, don't know how it's playing out, but we do see, yeah, a lot of a lot of non-Jewish people returning to to God, and and, and that process uh, I've noticed, I'm sure you've noticed, is that people start off as uh, traditional Christians, oftentimes evangelicals, and it's interesting because for the Jews to to be drawn to Messianic Judaism or one of the other groups. Uh, it's usually the very uneducated, the ones who are not very involved and just kind of have bagel and locks on Sunday and 
And with with the Christians that get involved, it's the exact opposite. It's the right. ones that are very devout, very right. uh, well versed in their in their scripture, and they they look at it and they say this this doesn't this doesn't add up, and they tend to go from uh, traditional Christianity to things like Hebrew roots to things like Messianic Judaism, and then uh, eventually uh, you know, make that make the stride to just traditional Judaism, whether actually converting or just maintaining that ideology as a Noahide or some variation of that, that's that that's the path that I've kind of seen. And that does that does feel very messianic. I, I wanted to ask you, based on your uh, knowledge and experience uh, over the past generation that that you've been doing this for 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 so long and impacted so many people and and have a unique um, insight, I think, into, the Christian world that a, lot, that a lot of folks in the Jewish uh, community don't have. So there's there's a, there's a lot of there, there's a lot of people that have mixed feelings about um, Christian support of Jews and Israel. Uh, in particular, with what's going on, uh, it's it's been that way for for quite some time. But now, especially, you know, we 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 certainly want more friends. We want more people to to. Uh, to be on our side and, and share our perspective and stand together with us. And, and I certainly uh, am very happy that that Christians uh, as a whole, especially the evangelicals, stand very strong uh, behind the Jewish people, behind Israel. There's always this, um, there's this rumor, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure you're well aware, that the reason that Christians want Jews to... Uh, that are, want Jews to either be in Israel or want to support Jews is is for eschatological reasons. It is for messianic times. Is to usher in the second coming. Uh, is for their own purposes, not really out of love of Jews or Israel, but more that this will help facilitate their own desire of having uh, Jesus return to 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 Earth. So I'd like to hear first of all: is that a widespread? belief in your in your experience and secondly where does where where do you perceive that the jewish world the traditional jewish world in particular should stand on that issue in the sense that should we be happy about receiving uh, that sort of support or is that something we should be leery of concerned about what what are your thoughts on all of that right mm. so it's important for people not to see this as an either or meaning that these evangelical Christians really are not pro-Israel, I don't love the Jewish people, uh, but rather they want to convert the Jews to trigger the second coming of Jesus. So actually all of it's correct. They, these people are not all, but almost all, what's called dis, premillennial dispensationalists, whatever that means is not germane, but they, come from a thread of Christianity that exploded in the 19th century, or really early 20th century, after Schofield uh, published his Bible in the very beginning of the 20th century. So these people really, really are very pro-Jewish. They're very pro-Israel. They really are. If you, it, they're, not, they're not putting on an act. They really support Israel. They really do. They also believe that it is much more important to convert Jews than anybody else. The New Testament says so, Romans 1.16, but they believe that the conversion of the Jews to Christianity will trigger the second coming of Jesus based on an obscure passage at the end of Matthew 23. So actually all of it is going on at the same time. I mean, these people now, so I've just said that they're, that they are really very pro-Israel. It's not like John Hagee really supports Hezbollah, but he's doing because he wants to. That's not going on. These people really, really are very pro-Israel. And they really, Hagee is not the best example of this because he has a very hard view. But all these other guys, the Southern Baptists, they, they, all of it's going on at the same time. Now, here's where it gets nefarious. is not where people expect it. What they then do is they weaponize their um, support for Israel. They take advantage, they leverage the humanitarian aid they provide for Israel. There's a lot of it going on. 
in a, as a way to reach Jewish people with the gospel and to have, let them know about Jesus, so the, they would become Christian. They'll, they'll say Messianic Jews. So it's all of it's going on. They really are genuinely pro-Israel. They're not, they're, they really are. And being pro-Israel would naturally nourish philo-Semitism. They really are interchangeable. And they really want the Jews to convert more than anybody else because they believe that the conversion of the Jews will trigger the second coming of Jesus, will the return of the Jews to Israel, will trigger what's called the War of Armageddon. It's a complete misnomer from the book of Revelation because whoever wrote it, presumably a guy named John, um, misread a passage in Zechariah. But whatever it is, they believe the Jews have to be here, which triggers a war of Armageddon. And that war where many Jews will die because of another misreading from another, this next chapter in Zechariah, chapter 13, that will trigger the second coming of Jesus. So all this is coming on. I mean, they want Eskimos to convert to Christianity. However, they don't believe that the people of you know, the people, uh, the Native American Indians, if they become Christians, that has anything to do with making Jesus come again. But they, they believe about Jews. So it's really all going on now. Should the Jewish community be uh, concerned? Oh, my God, yes. Very, very concerned. This is very disconcerting because there's a rule about Jewish evangelism which will surprise the viewers. In almost all cases— when a Jew is converted to Christianity, their first interaction is social. It's not with a professional missionary. It's not with someone on the staff of First Fruits of Zion. It's not with someone at Chosen People Ministries, but it's rather with someone they work with, someone they're in some uh, pro-Israel. Some, there's some social networking going on where the evangelism takes place. So because these evangelicals are exploiting their humanitarian aid in order to bring the— and they'll say this. They, in raising money, there's a lot of money out there for Jewish evangelists. They'll say, look, we are bringing aid to Jewish communities in the southern part of Israel, in the Gaza envelope, in no, providing for Holocaust survivors throughout the, throughout the state of Israel, in the displaced— um, Israelis who lived in the north and now can't be there because of the conflict with Lebanon. And we're using that to share the gospel with the Jews. And that is guaranteed to open the floodgates of money coming from Baptist churches, Assemblies of God churches. So they are very much providing humanitarian aid. However, they're weaponizing that humanitarian aid. And they therefore be very aware of this. When you bring in volunteers for your, that's where it happens. That's, that means if the relationship between Jews and Christians remained only between leaders, people like yourself and leaders among the, uh, in the Christian community, there would be no danger at all. What happens is there's this working together, but that's where the evangelism goes on. So we have to be very cautious of this. And really, we have to draw a line and just explain that Let's just don't cross that line. But there has to be a relationship based on mutual respect and understanding. Now, you're probably going, okay, that sounds like a good idea. It won't work. <laughs> that means no matter what you try to do, they're going to use every social interaction with the Jewish community in order to evangelize them. It's just going to happen, and there's nothing you can do about it, and you can't talk sense into them. It just won't. So I, I recently met a, a, a pastor, and, um, and and we're having this discussion. I, I was very very uh, open about my concerns. It wasn't a surprise for him. Uh, again, we, we weren't looking to we weren't looking to do anything big. I was just quite, I was just asking him sort of where his personal uh, devotion to the Jewish people come from, and I asked him straight out: Is it does this have to do with end times prophecy? Is this uh, is you know, are we a means to an end that, you, yeah, your, your, your love and support is, is being given, but that's really for the ultimate goal, which is the return of Jesus. And, and he, 
I, I don't think he was lying to me when he, he said that, he said, at the core of my love of the Jewish people is the, the blessing that God gives to Abraham that I, that I will bless those that bless you. Mm -hmm. And I believe, this person said, I believe that by, by me being a supporter of the Jewish people and an encourager of someone who encourages Jews to be Jewish, that I will, I too will be blessed. So it is, it is for my own personal benefit, but it is, but that's what scripture, what scripture teaches me that if I bless mm -hmm. the Jewish people, I too will be blessed. And so I, I support the Jews in every way and didn't make reference, even in an indirect sort of way to wanting to, to convert people. He was being very sincere with you. That means, so I'll just give you the lowdown. There's something very important that our viewers need to understand. In the 19th century, there was a guy named John Nelson Darby who came from England to the United States. And the United States was rather very receptive to Jews. And, you know, the founding fathers had a favorable view of Jews. They hated England. They hated King George III. There's a lot of reasons why. They, the key was that he came up with a revolutionary idea and that is that replacement theology is the mother load of bad ideas and that God has is continuing to work with the Jewish people. James Belfour, the foreign secretary of England, who signed the famous declaration in 1917, he, was, he believed this. That these people really believe that the Jews are chosen by God and they never lost that chosenness. Now, that may sound normal, but actually no other Christian believed that. The Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, you know, Luther, Calvin, none of them believed that. They all thought the Jews were once chosen. Uh, God had blessed them, but because of their, uh, because they not only didn't listen to God, but they had the tenacity to kill God or to kill Jesus, to actually, they were responsible for deicide, the most unimaginable crime. So therefore, they're in a cursed nation. They've lost their chosenness, and Israel doesn't belong to them. Along comes Darby says, no, this is all. Now, Darby has a lot to say. I'm just honing in on the part that is germane to your point. So it, it, this spread like wildfire in the United States. In the 20th century, Moody, all these guys are going to, 19th and 20th century, are going to move this along. And this becomes very, this spreads like wildfire. So their view on this actually is the same as mine, and I think many of our viewers, and that is that when the nations of the world bless Israel, they're saving themselves, not Israel. It means God has a covenant with Israel. It can't disappear. Um, it doesn't matter what the quartet, the, uh, the quartet, the, um, the United Nations, it, it doesn't matter. God has a promise that's irrevocable with the nation of Israel. Uh, we have a role in, in turn to be a light to the nations, which you and I have devoted our, our lives to that. But America now is at a fork in the road where it has to decide if it's going to save itself by blessing Israel. Because Genesis 12, verse 3, the fellow, the pastor you spoke to, says that God will bless those who bless Israel. Israel is going to be blessed by God. So the only way a nation could be saved is by blessing Israel. That's their view. They absolutely believe that. And therefore, America's, you know, I was born in the United States and so are you. Like, we both love America. We want America to succeed. My parents were both born in America. But in, in this view of Genesis 12, it's very clear that nations of the world are blessed if they bless Israel, and conversely, curse if they turn their back on Israel. However, that has you have to then separate that and go, but these people who b believe this, and they really do, he wasn't lying to you, he wasn't giving you a line. The other thing he left out of it, because uh, he knows it would offend you, is we want to see the Jewish people uh, accept Jesus as their Messiah, meaning they want Jews to become Christians. He, they all know that's that's a something that's like very offensive to Jewish people. So they're very careful with that. So everything he said to you is true. They really, I'm blessing Israel because 
God has told us in Genesis 12 that we're to bless Israel, and America is blessed because it blesses Israel. These evangelicals thoroughly believe that if America turns against Israel and becomes an enemy of Israel, America will be destroyed. Nothing short of that. Okay? They really, really believe that. But <laughs> now that they believe that, they also believe that the Jews, in order to be saved, have to accept Jesus, which is going to trigger a war of Armageddon, which is going to be a bloodbath. Now, they don't want there to be a bloodbath. I, I just want to—I don't want anyone to misunderstand this. They'd be very happy if something worked out and they just misunderstood this verse. They're not looking forward to any of this. They do believe it, but it's not like they want it. They just, so they will. This is where everyone gets in trouble. They will, however, use that relationship with Jewish people that they ordinarily would not have in order to share the gospel with the Jews. So they're weaponizing the humanitarian aid and love for the Jews. Now, they don't see it as weaponizing it. They'd be very careful, you know, because they don't see it that way. But right. they are, we have to be, you know, chabdeu v'chashdeu, we have to be very careful. When not talking about, let's say, Israel as, as a whole, uh, or as a as a as a country, but let's but as far as the value system, I mean, w one of the things that it, that I think traditional Christians of, of various denominations and traditional Jews share when talking about our country, about the United States, um, is this so-called Judeo-Christian values. I know the term is more is more recent, but uh, like like you had alluded to earlier, the concept of our founding fathers having a tremendous respect and devotion to the Hebrew Bible and making the structure uh, of what America should be based on is is based on the laws uh, again according to their understanding, but the laws of the Hebrew Bible. I, I would say mm -hmm. I would say, much more significantly than the Gospels, because the Hebrew Bible is where the laws and, and establishing a nation are are found, whereas the Gospels are are something quite different. But but uh, as far as the structure of the United States, I think the the early founding fathers and those that are adhering to traditional values uh, are right. are very much in line with that scope. So right. as far as as far as getting together with with folks from other faiths, in particular traditional Christians, about uh, social issues or other areas that uh, would would enhance the uh, so-called Judeo-Christian values in the United States, you you are you are open to that or or what would what would your perspective be? And part B of that uh, is have you just out of curiosity, have you come across anywhere from our sages, you know, our Hoiskim and, and, and whatnot in the 20th century uh, who are living post-term uh, Judeo-Christian values when that, when that, when that, when that uh, term began to be used in reference to traditional values? Are you aware of any Hoiskim that have used that term and have sort of endorsed that term? The view is that there's no such thing as a Judeo-Christian value. Now, of course, let me make this clear. There are many things in the Christian Bible that are true, but anything that's true in the New Testament isn't new. And anything new in the New Testament isn't true. That's always the view. So we can be very ecumenical and use, I mean, I wouldn't, but people use the term Judeo-Christian values and knock yourself out i believe what the what the term is meant to refer to is you know it's it is interesting that in all of human history uh, i think i think there's something that dennis prager talks about that jews and christians are the only uh, different faiths that share any bit of the same scripture and, and so I, I think when people say judeo-christian values what they are talking about is the bibles represented in the hebrew bible I, I don't I don't tend to like the term mm -hmm. Judeo-Christian values because I think Hebrew Bible values per, maybe captures it a bit better. Uh, I think that is the core of what a civil society is is meant to look like is captured in but in, in the Hebrew part of of, of Scripture. But um, I, I I I believe when people say Judeo-Christian values that that's that's what they that's what they mean. Obviously, the the Hebrew Bible and the the New Testament are, if you're certainly a traditional Jew, do not do not add up together. 
Um, but I, I believe that the term is is meant to to uh, be a reference to the thing that unites us, which is the Hebrew Bible. Sure. Look, it didn't hurt that Hamilton went to yeshiva in the island, the Caribbean island, in which he grew up in. Some scholars believe his mother converted to Judaism. The question is, was he born after or before the conversion? But he he could read Hebrew and speak fluently. So he had a very favorable view of the Jews. We know what George Washington thought about Jews. We have his writings that probably are in the synagogue in, in uh, Rhode Island. Uh, we, you know, the, the founding fathers had a favorable view of the Jews. Part of it, I think, this is not my field of expertise, but part of it is that America, America the founding fathers detested of the Church of England, from which they emerged, and it was that crucible of rejecting the Church of England and the royal brute of England, King George III, that um, they felt a kinship with the Jews, who also, you know, spent so many centuries not you know, thrown out of England. I mean, Shakespeare never met a Jew in his life. Um, the king, the right, the forty-seven translators of the King James Bible, who uh, tra who rendered the Christian Bible into the English language a dozen year a dozen years after the Merchant of Venice was penned by Shakespeare. These people never met Jews. Right, that's so, so interesting I mean, to think about. Mm. They never met a Jew in their life. Calvin never met a Jew in his life. Calvin spent half his life in France, his second half in Switzerland. He never met a Jew because, as it turns out, neither France nor S Switzerland allowed any Jews to live in that country when Calvin was running Geneva like a police state. Um, I mean, there's all craziness. Um, Luther, who was more anti-Semitic than any of them, uh, lived in Germany. He did encounter many Jews and talked about it. So, you know, so the founding fathers saw in the Jew a, a people who had survived the Church of England, who who the Church of England didn't like. So there must be something really good about them. So I think there's just many of these features that come into play um that intersect that would um would nourish would fuel the kind of thinking that you're accurately describing so what i'm understanding from you is that that within our own country it it may make sense oftentimes to to unite uh as far as the things that do make a better society a, a religiously minded society is a better minded society in in, in my view I, I i imagine you feel the same way um, mm -hmm. even if it's not in the same, necessarily in the same uh, overall perspective that, um, that we have. As far, as far as what traditional value should look like, family, faith, uh, and, and embracing that lifestyle, like, sure. I, would, I would imagine you, you would agree that across the board, anyone who's living with, uh, with a sense of belief in God and, uh, and, and whatnot is, is going to make this country into a better place. The primary author of the Declaration of Independence you know, had his famous, you know, Jefferson Bible, where he basically cut out all the miracles that Jesus putatively performed because he wasn't interested in that. Right. Absolutely. It was very much the Jewish part of the faith that they were very curious about rather than, um, rather than Paul's letters or things of that nature. Absolutely. If it were up to me, I think we could talk all day and have some really great and, and deep conversations and go into a lot of other interesting topics. Um, I don't want to keep you forever, though. And so I will thank you for, for coming and, and joining with us today. And um, I, I certainly wish you lots of blessings and luck in the, in the upcoming year and in your, in your holy endeavors and in all the good things and good work that you're doing. And uh, may we we see the fulfillment of the the work that that both of us are involved in from different angles in in spreading god's torah to to the world around i wish you only in this new year we should see the coming of the true mashiach quickly in our time and yeah. and all this suffering should come to an end and hope and and peace and
the glorification of Hashem uh, should spread throughout the world. We should be zeichet to witness this quickly in our time. So thank Amen. you for having me on, Rabbi. I mean, I look forward to, to continuing the conversation a different time.